um, um, our economic models uh, are changing um, their focus. Um, a lot of space is also taken up by uh, discussions of economic security in our uh, democracies. Huh? It, mostly come, it mostly comes from the, the geopolitical uh, pressures uh, we are facing, so the focus is on how to make ourselves more resilient. Huh? And uh, to simplify things a lot, you can probably do that in twofold way. Either you, you make your uh, system more impregnated against uh, the damage that can be caused from the outside, um, or you can uh, you know, grow from the inside, uh, develop uh, more uh, vibrant economic models, uh, which are better placed to resist uh, any uh, uh, impact from outside. Uh, so this is uh, the context in which uh, uh, I would like us to discuss now uh, the concept of brain capital, namely what can brain capital add to, to this uh, equation. So let me uh, welcome in alphabetical order Fred Destrebeck, whom we have kindly borrowed from the last panel, uh, the executive director of uh, European Brain Council. Joining us from Luxembourg is uh, Shiva Dustar, head of the European Investment Bank Institute. Uh, warm welcome, Shiva. Um, here in New York, uh, Mitchell Elkins, uh, chief clinical science officer of the American Heart Association. Also uh, here on the ground, Quasi uh, uh, Haig, the lead of uh, the lead and global mental health uh, and brain science committee chair at uh, Ramsey Healthcare. Uh, warm welcome as well, uh, John Occipinti uh, from the Faculty of Medicine and Health, University of Sydney. And last but not least, uh, in Brussels, I assume it's Alessia Terzi. Uh, from the European Commission, who is also author of the book, which we can now see on the screen, uh, Growth for Good. <laughs> That's very smart. Uh, reshaping Capitalism to Save Humanity from Climate Catastrophe. Warm uh, welcome, Alessio. I guess we, we can sense what you might want to talk about. <laughs> Um, but starting uh, from uh, Joan, because uh, Joan uh, is going to launch uh, uh, something uh, very special, uh, namely uh, the U.S. Uh, Mental Wealth Observatory Project. Uh, and the concept of mental wealth is extremely interesting because it's, it is about bringing uh, the relationships between the different uh, determinants of mental health and well-being uh, together. And uh, my question to, to Joan will be, as she uh, launches the observatory, um, how actionable can this be for uh, the policymakers? John, please. Thank you. Um, excuse me, my brain fog solution. Um, <laughs> so to answer that question, um, really need to create some uh, context at, at, a, at a high level. I think we all understand, everyone in this room understands that uh, economic systems, um, environmental systems, social and political systems are all interrelated. Um, and so achieving economic security and resilience and human flourishing really depends on a balance of those interconnected systems. Um, but metrics can be a powerful destabilising force. Um, about 60 years ago, you'll know that the OECD had their founding meeting in December 1960 and committed to, uh, signed a member country signed a convention committing to, uh, uh, the, globally to uh, the foremost objective of sustainable economic growth. Um, uh, and it quickly became, GDP growth quickly became uh, a key indicator of a government's good management of their economies and the, and the welfare of their nations. Um, but system science teaches us that um, overemphasis on optimising one system can actually destabilise other interconnected systems, giving rise to a broad range of symptoms we now recognise as the social determinants of health and, and mental health. Um, and we've been in such ruthless pursuit of greater and greater economic efficiency and worker productivity um, uh, that uh, to achieve that continuous growth in GDP that our health, social, political and environmental systems are now showing significant signs of deterioration and, and fragility. Um, so we must act systemically. 
um, without systemic action, we're merely treating the symptoms and huge amounts of resources are going to, to need to be continuously invested in order to um, meet the demands for human services that are arising from these manifestations. Um, so the number one priority for redressing this imbalance is, is uh, at least in our view, um, a realising uh, a more comprehensive top-line indicator of a nation's uh, uh, well-being, both economically and socially. Now, there have been decades of attempts to try and come up with an alternative measure of prosperity, none of which have been successful in, in displacing GDP as the, the top-line indicator. Um, and that's because uh, GDP provides uh, a gold standard, oh, sorry, a global standard for measuring economic activity and its infrastructure is intensive, uh, extensive and it's entrenched. Um, but it has evolved over time to encompass a broader range of activities and I think as, as recently as 1993, uh, finance was deemed explicitly productive and, in, and included in GDP. Um, so the mental wealth metric simply seeks to expand that boundary of production further to, to include those unpaid activities that really strengthen the social fabric of communities. Um, and these unpaid activities, uh, you'll know, include volunteering and charity work, uh, uh, caregiving, civic participation, environmental restoration and others. And they're collectively known as social production. Um, and our recent report showed that in 2021, Americans contributed more than $2.3 trillion in social production. Um, and this is certainly an underestimate due to data gaps. Um, so why should we include social production in, in GDP? Um, well, social productions are the glue that hold complex societies together. Uh, they give us a sense of purpose and belonging and connectedness that fosters mental, mental health. Uh, they support our ability to be productive in the formal economy. Uh, they improve environmental well-being and they give us surge capacity to be able to respond or mobilise effectively in times of crisis as we've seen. Um, so in essence, um, social production makes nations more prosperous and, and more resilient. Um, and valuing social production also promotes a more inclusive narrative of a contributing life, that, that our value extends beyond simply making money in the formal economy. Um, and it will help shift the narrative from one of continuous growth in GDP to one um, more focused on balance between our economic production and social production. Um, and of course, there's a lot more I can say about the activities of the, the Mental Wealth Initiative, but this is uh, one of our foremost activities. But to answer your question the long way around, um, the Mental Wealth Framework uh, really, we hope, will help pivot the policy focus more towards three areas, the first being, importantly, brain capital, in order to drive both economic and social productivity. Um, programs to guard against unemployment, which we know undermines um, uh, a brain capital. And of course, investments in social capital infrastructure. So uh, when uh, you know, governments want to stimulate the economy, instead of investing in, in roads and bridges and tunnels, they should be investing in social capital infrastructure to build our social prosperity, um, uh, which ultimately helps to improve our economic prosperity and security. Um, Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Joan. Uh, that was uh, extremely uh, persuasive. So um, I'm tempted to stay in this, in this vein and go now to Alessio uh, before coming to Shiva with a simple question, how do we finance uh, all these things uh, and what role the, the multilateral banks can play? Uh, but, but Alessio, you have, you have written the, the book uh, which again looks at... Um, how to remodel capitalism to um, integrate the sustainability dimension uh, more into the heart of it. And here we have just heard from, from Joanne um, about the, the need to uh, look at the, uh, the social uh, production and include that in the equation as well. Uh, so can you, can you tell us a little bit more about your, your thinking with respect to um, the climate uh, focus and uh, and how it relates to uh, economic security, right? Because in uh, in, in many discussions, um, 
uh, the, the simple focus to today would be on, on building uh, resilience, on making sure that uh, geopolitically our economies uh, um, become stronger. So what role does the, um, the green industrial revolution play in this process? Very well, thank you very much. Um, good evening from Brussels, or good day to you. And uh, thanks for having me uh, today. I guess your your question is uh, is uh, very broad, but I'll try to uh, to tackle it head on. Indeed, my work has concentrated on uh, trying to understand whether it is possible uh, to reconcile the economic dimension and nature, loosely uh, speaking. And of course, um, to a certain extent, uh, there is this belief that this is not possible, and that indeed. Uh, if you've exerted too much pressure on, uh, on one side, this has come at the detriment of the other, and this has to be uh, the only way. And therefore, in order to restore or reconcile our relationship with nature, we have to downsize the economy or put a break, at the very least, on economic growth. And in the book, or more broadly in my work, I try to, to show and argue how uh, this has been the case, so indeed the, the situation we're currently in is problematic and this should not be downplayed, but that a different growth is possible, a different economy is possible, one that reconciles us humans with nature and our well-being broadly defined as it should be, and as Joanne was mentioning, uh, with our need to um, fight climate change, uh, restore uh, the natural environment, uh, and, and so on. And so this is a bit the framework in which I enter. Now the, the big, uh, so one side is saying this is possible at a theoretical level, which is what I try to do in part of my work. And the challenge is how to make it happen. And on that, I would, um, you've mentioned one of the framings I've used for the challenge we have ahead of us which to my mind will resemble an industrial revolution, which is why I speak of a green industrial revolution, uh, in the fact that it requires reinventing completely our economies and, uh, and restructuring completely our economies. And, and this is something we've seen before. And we have seen it when uh, industrial revolutions have played out uh, and restructuring our energy systems which is something we have seen in the past. And so we have to do that, and we have to do it against a timeline, which is given to us by climate science. And that is why, uh, whereas past industrial revolutions have played out sort of uh, on their own time schedule, the time schedule at which they played out was over 50 years, over 60 years, if we think of the first or, or second industrial revolution, depending on how you measure these things, we don't have the benefit of this amount of time. And that is why we're looking and thinking um, at policy measures uh, to achieve this. And of course, you know, there's the whole plethora of, of things that governments uh, can do, and I will not enter into that. Um, but I will just say one thing, which in a way relates to the, to the broader issue of, of, uh, of framing some of these issues and uh, of how the brain to a certain extent uh, works. Uh, which is one small part of my work, but I think it's important and, and related to the overall topic of the panel, which is that climate change and climate fight um, is usually framed as, has a very negative framing, as in everything we do at best is gonna preserve what we currently have, and at worst is gonna alleviate the negative consequences of a very negative future. Um, the horizons we look at are between now and 2100, generally for these type of projections, 2050 at best. Um, and usually the framing is we're doing all of this because it's in the interest of our children and our grandchildren, which if not are gonna be uh, left on a boiling planet uh, uh, facing catastrophes, uh, which is all true. So on the surface of it is true. And I, while completely agreeing with all of this, I try to give a different type of framing which is the one along the lines of a green industrial revolution that allows a positive framing, which is uh, fundamental because it, it highlights 
let's say, a local benefit at the very beginning already, because there are economic opportunities to be made by firms that see the opportunities in uh, changing their uh, economic model and servicing the needs of consumers that are increasingly wanting more green options, um, it reduces the temporal difference, uh, the temporal distance, because what I'm talking about is benefits that are happening in the very near future. If you manage to pioneer green technologies now, you will be making profits in a very short time. And we're not talking about 2100, we're talking about uh, three, four, five, years from now, which is over an investment horizon. And finally, it links to personal benefits. So it's something you're doing also in your own interest. It means better air quality. It means um, better cities, uh, better living conditions more broadly uh, if, we, if we transform our cities to make them climate proof. And so I think that this is a sort of framing that brings people together uh, on a green uh, agenda. Of course, and I will conclude uh, going to your question on the resilience side, uh, one part of making uh, the green transition happen is to make an economic success out of it. And I think that um, this is a central element in the context of, of economic security uh, that, you were, uh, that you were discussing, which is to say it cannot happen that the green transition is done uh, powered by technologies developed only in one uh, country, and this can be the US or, or, or China or Japan, it doesn't matter, uh, but it will not gain a consensus uh, if it means uh, effectively um, jobs moving somewhere else and manufacturing moving somewhere else and so on. And so we need to reconcile the economic dimension and the green transition also in this respect. Again, I think this is possible uh, but nonetheless, a challenge, and I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alessio. Super interesting, and uh, and in line with our earlier discussions uh, today, which were more focused um, on brain health and mental health uh, issues, and uh, in the recent panel, education and uh, and, and workforce uh, development, uh, because uh, there was also a strong element of reinvention of the model um, there. Uh, looking uh, at the life uh, span perspective uh, to brain health, for example, looking at outcomes uh, in, in healthcare. So that's very interesting. I want to stay on uh, the other side of the Atlantic and, uh, and ask uh, Shiva, first of all, maybe to a little bit comment to what Alessio said in terms of, I mean, you are, you are sitting at, uh, at Europe's major investment bank. And, uh, and, and when you hear uh, the arguments about reinventing completely our economies, as Alessio uh, put it, uh, I mean, how, uh, how do you read that? <laughs> how, um, I mean, um, how actionable do you think this, uh, this could be? I mean, you have your, your strategy, you have your ways, uh, you have your investment um, committees working, uh, and, and there is, of course, a reinvention which is um, happening as we as we speak, but, but how can this uh, um, conceptual uh, approach be uh, adopted? And, and, and also maybe with respect to the EIB's uh, role uh, in, in the current investment climate, we would, we would love to hear um, in particular how you leverage uh, private sector uh, in investment uh, in uh, climate-related but also health-related uh, projects. Thank you very much, Pavel. I hope I hope you hear me well. Um, yes, very well. So, so greetings uh, from Luxembourg. I, I I don't know about Alessio, but I'm certainly having a lot of FOMO not being with all that amazing brain power. Um, so uh, you know, I I really. Um, However, I'm quite happy to be on this panel and thanks for inviting me. Um, to your first question, it is indeed a tall order. And um, however, I would say where we are, I think where we in Europe uh, have perhaps a very strong advantage is that we, if I may say so, have the European Investment Bank as sort of the, the financing arm of the European Union, which in a way as so the European Union is setting policy and, and putting directionalities or mission orientation into uh, accelerating, let's say, the green or digital transition, the EIB follows, uh, you know, follows with that. Um, 
and develops the sort of right financial mechanisms that ultimately allow us to channel investments faster into those policy areas. So um, now this is something that is actually uh, quite critical given indeed some of the uh, climate emergencies and and other, you know, we had the pandemic uh, where you have to really have that ability to channel uh, the public sector uh, financing sort of at, at a more central level, sort of in, in our case, the EIB kind of taking um, risk earlier, coming in with larger amounts and staying in longer. So in a way, um, paved the way for then private sector financing to follow. And uh, also providing sort of that um, expertise in terms of advisory services uh, to to actually bring those issues that Alessio has brought a bit to the forefront of the discussion. And this is perhaps also where the EIB Institute, which I'm heading, is very much mandated increasingly. And that that is something um, which I hope that also this conversation today. Um, you know, helps to 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 kind of bring into EIB's own consciousness the brain capital, uh, because the EIB Institute, in a way, is the the sort of arm uh, of the group that looks at um, sort of sets up the thought leadership of the uh, EIB group. It has, of course, all its philanthropic activities and has the ability to therefore convene and help the bank to future proof itself by bringing that sort of uh, external perspective into the bank. Um, so perhaps maybe very quickly in terms of examples, what, what does it concretely mean uh, that, you know, for the EIB sort of to, to uh, mobilize that private capital? I give you two examples. One is um, actually a very interesting one if you sort of take a historical perspective into it. In two, I mean, already since 2009, uh, we were looking at infectious diseases and we were trying to figure out how actually uh, we could use, um, you know, EIB type of financing where you need to have a certain level of uh, bankability of, or investment readiness in a field of infectious diseases. We were talking, at, we we're looking at uh, TB, malaria, and, and those more classical uh, diseases uh, that were under, chronically underfunded and trying to make, you know, look into that space. We eventually, with a lot of good um, consultation uh, with a number of member states, with the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation and others, set up actually a facility called um, uh, the Infectious Diseases Finance Facility jointly with the European Commission. Uh, this is where it, the European Commission instead of, you know, took some of the grants that they actually would have otherwise just put into research projects and put it into a financial instrument, which gave the EIB uh, very sort of high risk coverage to allow us to actually go into these infectious diseases. This is already, you know, starting in 2015. But the reason this was actually very, um, I guess, important is in 2020, of course, as the pandemic hit, we had an instrument where we would we were able within weeks to mobilize 100 million into the BioNTech vaccine and some other vaccines um, against COVID. So um, I guess what to, you know the lessons learned here are. As a fine, you know, as a public sector bank, you need to very often come into areas that are not necessarily that the private sector for all sorts of reasons um, cannot really tackle if you have the right policy support and uh, risk taking um, a risk sharing between in this case it was the European Commission and the EIB you actually then set up instruments that then mobilize uh, that you know seed capital and with that seed capital, you de-risk where then other capital comes in. Another quick example would be the green bonds, which the EIB pioneered already in 2007. And as you know, the green uh, bond market is actually a 3 trillion <clears throat> euro market. Of course, uh, now uh, many, I mean, multilaterals, but also many companies issue green bonds. What makes them green is the use of proceeds uh, go into um, you know, projects that meet certain criteria. We have green, uh, we have sort of the climate and the sustainability awareness bonds. And I think in the context of the brain deals and brain capital, maybe food for thought, how could we potentially have in the future also, I don't know what, what we would call them, brain bonds or something along those lines to, 
to channel um, financing into the brain capital or brain economy that obviously is the discussion today. So a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of food for thought uh, that will come out of uh, this conference. I uh, unfortunately didn't catch all the panels, but look forward to, to the conversation. And maybe the last thing I throw in, and Pavel, you know that I will always do that whenever I get a chance, is I don't know whether today a gender lens was brought into the discussion of brain capital, because I, I hope that we make the brain economy one that has, um, you know, has a gender lens and, and equal access to, to capital and, and, and of course, brain. So Great. with that, thank I stop. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Shiva. So whenever the brain bonds are created, uh, the copyrights uh, definitely will go back to you. And we will remember today's discussion as uh, the launching pad for it. Uh, well, I don't know if you if you have been with us before, but uh, uh, but we featured the launch of the first brain capital related uh, venture funds today, which is uh, by uh, the Paris based uh, new funds um, venture fund, and together with uh, Fondation Fondamentale. Uh, so uh, we see that there is uh, there is a lot of interest in the investment uh, community in adopting this uh, this approach, and would love to. Uh, continue the um, the conversation. Um, great. So let me now uh, turn to uh, Mitch and sort of gradually move into um, uh, the um, the healthcare domain. Um, and what I would like to ask uh, Mitch to to share his take uh, on with us is how one uh, recon how can one reconcile the demands uh, that were voiced during the day today, especially uh, equity, broader uh, access, uh, focus on outcomes, uh, with the, the, the demand for economic resilience. I mean, or to cut the long story short, if you were to make the argument uh, to uh, the, the Treasury um, uh, team, um, how would you, where would you start? Well, thank you. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you very much also for inviting me to uh, be here today to sit on this panel and speak, and thank you, Harris, for the invitation as well. It's really a pleasure to be here, um, and I will try to answer your question, but I'm just going to make a couple of comments that have come up in my head as the day has gone on. Uh, first of all, I think some of you may be wondering why is the American Heart Association here at an event on brain capital, right? It's a fair question. Um, but I would say that actually having the Heart Association here, I think, reflects exactly what you're trying to do in thinking about how we move from that concept of human capital to brain capital. And uh, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a cardiologist, I'm a neurologist, so I feel, feel very comfortable in this group today. But, um, you know, I like the idea of thinking holistically about health. This came up yesterday as well. And I think, you know, we recognize that cardiovascular health is foundational to brain health, right? People who have heart disease have strokes. People who have high blood pressure, diabetes, they go on to develop dementia and cognitive problems and so forth. And the flip side of that, though, which is equally important, but I think underappreciated, is that brain health is also foundational to cardiovascular health, or for that matter, to health in general, right? We know that if people don't have mental health, they're going to smoke at greater rates. Uh, if people um, uh, have a neurological disorder, like a stroke or uh, a disabling or paralyzing condition, they can't get the physical activity that they need for their cardiovascular health. So these things are related back and forth. And, and obviously at this meeting today, we're focused on the brain piece of it. But if we think about resilience, the cardiovascular piece and the general health of the individual is equally important. And I think we're doing a good job here today of uh, bringing together, you know, we had a lot of discussion this morning about mental health in children. Uh, we're bringing together the psychiatrists, the neurologists, the folks who really care deeply about the brain. But I think as we think about, um, you know, brain capital and how we're gonna move this concept forward, I think there are a lot of other clinicians that we'll wanna bring into the conversation, whether they're cardiologists, primary care doctors, geriatricians, nephrologists, you know, all the people who are dealing with health 
holistically as well. And then I think, of course, we're also going to need to bring in uh, people, which we are doing here today, from the policy field, from economics, obviously, and from a number of other areas as well. It's really going to be, you know, all hands on deck kind of approach if we're going to make this happen. Um, also, I think we can leverage what the Heart Association has done over the last hundred years. So we've learned, uh, you know, about how to advance cardiovascular health. We've seen tremendous improvements in cardiovascular, decreases in cardiovascular disease and improvements in cardiovascular health over the last century. And what I would like to see us do is to uh, see how we can do for the brain what the Heart Association has done for the heart over the last hundred years. And one of those things is to shift from thinking only about cardiovascular disease and heart attacks and, you know, heart failure and cardiovascular death, right, which has been the focus for much of the last uh, 50 years or so, and to think about health. Cardiovascular health is really what we at the Heart Association focus on now. How can we make sure that people are healthy, again, to the point about resilience. The third thing I'll say about that is just that as we think about brain health and brain capital, I think an important part of it that's really uh, neglected is what that means about how uh, neuroscience is important to understanding how we maintain health in general. What about behavioral science? How do we get people to eat healthier, to exercise, to quit smoking, to do all the, to stop doing the things that are unhealthy and, and engage in healthy behaviors? That's really a question, you know, uh, traditionally that's been left to the cardiovascular folks to try to manage that, but those are really neurological questions, you know, how do we get people to change behaviors? Psychiatric, psychological, neurological brain questions, how do we do that? If we think about, you know, the latest blockbuster drugs that are coming out, right, the GLP-1 inhibitors that everybody's taking now for weight loss, frankly, but also for, you know, diabetes and now heart failure uh, and related cardiometabolic conditions, those drugs work in the brain, right? They decrease our uh, desire for food as well as, you know, other aspects of addiction potentially, and they have dramatic effects working in the brain. Those are neurological drugs. But, you know, we kind of seed those to other areas because perhaps traditionally the brain folks haven't been involved in caring for those conditions. So I think, you know, brain health extends beyond just, um, uh, you know, disease and disorders to also include the neuroscience behind how we make these kinds of decisions. And I think as far as brain capital goes, uh, as we shift from cardiovascular health to brain health, we're thinking not only about the absence of dementia and cognitive problems, but also how do we, you know, think positively about brain health, creativity, attention, uh, openness, you know, entrepreneurship, et, et cetera, all those things that, that Harris and, and others of you here have been, been focusing on. So I'd like to see us try to think about those aspects as we go about it. Super, thank you so much. Um, by the way, uh, we will have time for a couple of questions, so if... Uh, Anyone is interested, please uh, give me a, a shout of some sort. Uh, but before that happens, uh, Fred, um, what I want to ask you is pretty much in the same vein. I mean, let's, let's maybe stay um, with the example of uh, how do we uh, convince uh, the um, economic uh, masters of the ceremony of the case for greater investment uh, in brain-related matters. Uh, and there are probably two sides to the equation. I mean, yesterday uh, at, the, uh, at the wonderful discussion that you chaired, uh, we had a presentation on the global uh, burden of brain disorders. So that's one angle to take, namely to see what the cost uh, tag uh, is already and how that can be reduced and how that will evolve as the societies age. And the other side of the coin is innovation, um, namely um, how much can one gain by uh, investing more in innovative uh, projects. Uh, and, and you are hosting in a few weeks' time uh, the Brain Innovation Days uh, in Brussels to address that, that problem. I mean, well, well, which side of the equation would you find uh, uh, more appealing and more tactically smart, I suppose, uh, if we were to have that type of conversation? Well, uh, I would say, having a background in political science, I would say both, uh, and uh, all in all. Um, but first of all, thank you, Pavel, and thank you, Harris, for having me, and sorry for hijacking this panel. 
I know I was uh, scheduled later, um, so I won't, I won't take too much um, of time of my co-panelist. But I actually wanted to echo what Mitchell was, was just saying about like having uh, a positivity in our narrative, but also making sure we master the neuroscience of persuasion. And I'll give you exactly the counter example that my organization has been struggling with, um, or that my predecessors were struggling with, having produced a study on the cost and burden of brain disorders in 2011. Um, and that actually was mentioned in our introduction yesterday, um, where we estimated that the cost for managing brain disorders in Europe every year amounted to 800 billion euros. Um, and the case that was tried to be made at that point of time was to put it in perspective against cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disorders, um, saying that brain was uh, exceeding all these three altogether. Not to say that they are more important, but at a stage where they were completely under-recognized in public financing, it was probably important to, to kind of re-equilibrate uh, in the context of framework programs for research and, uh, and innovation. But where we missed our target um, was to stop, let's say, the message there and to leave it with the message of saying brain disorders are costly, patients are a burden, there are no solutions, there are no cure, brain science is complex, but please, policymakers, continue to give us money, but we can't commit to any result. So I guess that in terms of like compelling message and, and persuasion, that's, that's where we failed. So, so it's where also we felt we needed to, to put it in a kind of positive mode in celebrating successes, uh, starting to talk about like uh, beautiful stories in terms of um, startups, innovators coming up with new solutions. I mean, quite a few uh, technological developments were presented today. Um, but we also had uh, very concrete examples where biology now delivers. Uh, when it comes to, to, to crack brain disorders. And that's how, um, and Pavel, thanks for the promotion of the Brain Innovation Days. So we'll have that uh, next month in Brussels. That was really the attempt for us to bring a positive narrative around what is currently being done in the ecosystem. We are not going to wait for um, public investors or policymakers to actually create the framework we need, but we a should actually celebrate what the community is able to do and bring people together from all the tiers uh, of, the, of that ecosystem. At EBC, we do represent patient organizations, clinical and scientific societies, and the private sector, but we really wanted to engage with innovators, uh, investors, uh, VCs, you basically name it. Um, yeah, and I'd like to maybe finish with a word of so also of appreciation about today's event um, and everything that was said so far because I believe that in our work in trying to convince uh, Alessio's colleagues and uh, Shiva's colleagues in Brussels, Luxembourg, and uh, whatever um, European capital city, um, we feel that having a vision in, in our work uh, is extremely important. So kudos to uh, Harris for the brain capital industry strategy, um, because we need inspirational ideas to move, to move the needle. Um, we were very encouraged um, to hear, okay, we've got something in, um, in Brussels with the President of the European Commission making a state of the European Union, so you can immediately see where the, where the inspiration comes from. But so a speech every year where she gives all the, give, the big um, policy orientation uh, at the EU level, and she could not avoid talking about health uh, in the context of the COVID pandemic. That was the first time ever. Um, health issues had such a high degree of prioritization. Uh, mental health came about when um, actually they could not avoid noticing the highest prevalence of, um, of depression and anxiety in a kind of post-COVID era. Um, we were very much encouraged that skills and youth were also being prioritized with uh, European years. Um, but we see that that momentum is now fading away. So even in a context with the war in Ukraine that is impacting Europe uh, quite heavily, um, these issues are no, nowhere to be seen. And um, just um, the latest I've heard, but Pavel, maybe you have more information on that. The, the next year that is being considered is uh, the European year of cycling. So it's great that we are addressing one of the biggest uh, risk factor in terms of physical activity, but there is probably a need to uh, you know, be a bit more visionary than that. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Fred. Uh, the year of cycling, you said. Okay, well, I mean, as a passionate cycler, a cyclist, I... Uh, and, and it doesn't say if anything is done for concussion prevention, but that's yes, another story. Yes, absolutely. No, I see what you mean. 
um, uh, entirely. Um, right. I, I, we already have two questions that were signaled to me, but I want to ask uh, quasi uh, a couple of difficult questions. <laughs> Namely, uh, I mean, you, you sit at a, at a healthcare company dealing with mental health. Uh, we have discussed mental health uh, earlier uh, today. If there was, uh, I think, one uh, message that uh, we would share also uh, with Alessio and, and Shiva from that, so it's the need for life cycle approach. Uh, prevention, prevention and prevention, then early intervention, different as they are. But again, how does that look like from the economic resilience uh, point of view? Namely, how easy and how difficult is it to demonstrate the economic value added of this, uh, of this approach? And, and if it is easy, then why aren't we doing that? Uh, that's one question, but if you could also tell us a little bit uh, about uh, uh, the structured and unstructured data in mental health, uh, because for the, this transition towards outcomes-based uh, healthcare, uh, structured data that uh, has the right value is essential. Uh, so, in your in your world, uh, in uh, in your daily realities, uh, how fast do you think we are we are making the transition towards better quality and uh, better structured data? There's a very easy question. Thank you, Pavel. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I'll start just by thanking Harris. I only met him a few weeks ago. Uh, but he's very persuasive and engaging, and um, <laughs> um, I'm on a tie chair with um, a microphone. But um, um, seriously, though, I think the brain strategy is really compelling. Um, its mission orientation, I think, is, is right, and um, um, it's, it's great to hear here. I mean, I don't know anybody here, but it's been fantastic to meet some brilliant people. And I think I like the international perspective um, of thinking. Um, the multi-professional perspective also adds value, and it's been great to hear the case histories that are coming particularly from California. So um, I think to answer that, um, I'll just say a little bit about what I do, because I think it just adds a little bit of perspective yeah. to, the, to the lens. Um, so I started off as a neurologist and then studied law and went across to uh, academic forensic psychiatry and clinical psychiatry. So I did that for a while and then went into healthcare management and in recent years have been developing healthcare companies. So in 2017, with some really talented friends, we set up an independent healthcare company. We, we, and we wanted to do it differently in terms of public-private partnerships in the UK. Um, so Elysium grew, and then last year it joined a global organization called Ramsey, and I lead the innovation um, across the mental health and brain science across a number of countries there with, with, with the regional teams. So Australia, um, Southeast Asia, France, Northern Europe, and the UK. Um, and then the other perspective, um, I've been really privileged to be president of the International Association of Forensic Mental Health Services, which is a global policy and practice body where we have, um, really bring together clinicians, academics, um, um, lived experience um, groups to, I think, look at models of care and think about practices that can be used to, to refresh and also think about the, the human rights perspectives of care as well. Um, so we've done some really great work. Um, well, I'm really part of the work we've done in terms of supporting low and middle income countries, setting up mental health services, and think about how those models work in terms of need. And we've, we've done that by budding um, new services up, new countries up with um, established uh, programs, both academically from a training perspective, but also in terms of an operational perspective as well. And there, you know, there's been quite a lot of interest about how we use data um, to, to, to kind of um, steer your path in terms of um, agreeing the right model. Um, the other bit I'd add, and like any psychiatrist, you start off talking about childhood, but I think it is important. Um, I, I mean, I, I left um, Bangladesh in the early 70s in a hurry. We had a very bloody civil war. I ended up um, in the UK, and I was very fortunate to grow up in Liverpool, um, which, is a, which is a fantastic welcoming city, um, especially if you wear the right football kit. Um, <laughs> but the key element there was that there's a fierce sense, I think, of identity, but also rights and fairness. And I think that's been quite important, especially as you start to develop um, in, in, in the field that I work in. So fast forward to thinking about prevention. I, I think when I was practicing clinically, I wasn't aware of some of the kind of broader um, public health elements that were affecting day-to-day -day clinical care. Um, so when you were seeing young people, adults who were in contact with the criminal justice system in South London, where there are many markers of ill health, 
Um, I was very kind of narrowly focused on, on those outcomes. But actually, there were much, I think, more sinister um, forces at play. And I think um, some of you may be familiar of um, a little girl called Ella, um, Ella's story recently, who um, between the ages of seven and nine um, had multiple admissions to hospital with breathing difficulties, and she sadly passed away at the age of nine. Mm. And she grew up in Lewisham. Um, and the pathologist looking into her death identified for each of those 27 admissions that there was a clear temporal link with spikes in her air quality locally, mm. so nitrogen dioxide. So quite unusually, they actually put air pollution as a causal factor leading to her death. So our mayor has been really kind of focused on improving air quality in London. Um, now, I, th I think about that now in terms of the patients I was seeing and you know, what I was doing in terms of just getting their psychosis straight, keeping them, you know, getting them right pro properly connected with um, youth justice. But actually, there were far more toxic elements that I think, you know, with the degree of activism you have when you're younger, you can do things about, but evidence moves on. So you know, I, th I think there's a kind of positive side to that. Um, and of course, we're in an era now where many of the people with mental health difficulties that we care for have reduced life expectancy comparatively because of these factors and also the physical health side, the cardiovascular side, obesity um, and diabetes. And the, the concern obviously is that with COVID and coming out of COVID, when you think about prevention, that parity gap has widened. You know, it's actually more, it's harder now, isn't it? So we have a duty to try and narrow that again. So I think just reflecting on the last day and a half, and I've been listening a lot, I've been to all the sessions, and, um, yep. um, and um, I've really enjoyed the fact that um, um, we've talked about health, so systems in terms of health rather than ill health. Um, I think we've obviously taken a, a, a really holistic view on prevention, and I see that across many countries, and um, um, where I think there is a common pressure, and the, and the two common pressures I find are um, an aging population who are using healthcare differently, but still intensively, um, but also, of course, a workforce that is shrinking. And then, of course, the geopolitics of migration and other factors that I think are affecting cohesion. Mm. So many countries are trying to lean into these changes and transform. But the problem is that when you look at what the investments are being made to deal with this, the commitments made, I think, to prevention are fairly shallow. Mm. Um, there might be around the edges around about school interventions um, or perhaps you know, p particular kind of aspects of, of, of the social ecosystem, but actually pulled together, there isn't really the collaboration that you see that is needed. Um, and actually then, most of the investment goes back to trying to improve the existing healthcare service and get, try and squeeze every single pip out of it. And we, we, we know that doesn't work. And we've, we've learned through COVID actually that the current model isn't very resilient. Because when your public health policies are there to try and protect the current model, that doesn't, that sounds kind of oxymoronic, I think. You know, you kind of, it's not really dealing with the individual. So, I think, I think that's right, and I think the other bit is that, you know, clearly the root of this is inequality and inequity, and um, we have to correct that. Um, so if I use the UK as an example, um, so now I'm going to move on to a forward-looking view about how prevention could work. Um, I think there are areas where perhaps there have been really laudable attempts to create integrated systems where there is incentivization um, to support prevention. So we're in a number of these organizations. So Elysium was created because we saw a, a public-private divide, certainly, I think, in the kind of hospital end of the space, which wasn't really linked to local need. Um, so by creating integrated systems where you're meeting local need in local communities, but also provi providers working together so that any efficiencies when you pool are reinvested back into the community and prevention models, that's what works. Um, and we've seen some really good examples of that. Uh, particularly where that investment is back in housing um, and, and, and the aspects that we've spoken about earlier. And, you know, I was really interested in the work that's being done in the ecosystem in California at the moment. I think that that's the kind of stuff you need to do. Um, but unfortunately, I think that isn't the model that we're seeing everywhere in the UK. Um, and I don't think, I think when people talk about the lack of evidence, it's a bit of a fig leaf. I think there is a question about leadership um, and not necessarily political leadership, but leadership at systems levels leadership and the people that are making reimbursement decisions and changing the model and the incentives. And also, I think, leadership from the perspective of how investors look at value. Well, we were very fortunate, took up, but took our time to find investors that would get us going, um, that were mission-orientated and saw the, the bigger picture. And that's, that, that takes a bit of yep. doing. 
So just, just to finish, and um, what I would say for it to work, because if, 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 if the idea or what you're putting forward in your question is that prevention, if it's done properly, will create a more resilient system that will be able to deal with, I think, a more turbulent environment. So an environment where we've got geopolitical influences, uh, economic tailwinds, including inflation, future pandemics, then I think there's some things that we could have to do as part of these missions. Firstly, I think we have to be absolutely robust about uh, evaluation. We need to be confident that what we're doing actually generates good quality outcomes, and that requires, I think, better design trials. Um, I kind of get a lot of comeback that it's very hard to do this in mental health, but actually, you know, I, I use cancer as our beacon, cancer care, and what you've done in 10, 10 years around this with proper structural alignment of organizations with academia and industry to get people into trials. Um, the second thing I need, we need to do, I think, is make sure that um, as we look at prevention, we try and do it earlier. So um, if I, I read Thomas Insel's book recently on healing, which his chapter on prevention is just, I think, really absolutely nailed it in that um, a lot of the prevention we do in mental health is tertiary. So it's, you know, he, he uses the analogy of aspirin after a heart attack, which is fine for first onset psychosis, but actually um, we need to be more focused on identifica identification and intervention earlier. Um, and of course, AI and genomics are gonna help with that. But I think there's something really powerful that came today from the morning sessions th that a lot of what's going to work is about reconnecting our societies and communities after what's been a very turbulent two or three years. You know, we've got kids who left education and never came back. AI is not gonna fix that. We're going to have to get back to some of the kinds of um, you know, coping. Joe's talked about that's gonna make a difference. Yep. Um, and then finally, if I may, because you know, there's two questions or three, um, is that I think we need to make sure that um, with the innovation that's coming in those areas, um, we don't widen the inequality gap for those who are particularly disadvantaged. Um, yep. And that's where equity is important. Awesome. Wonderful, great, uh, great points. <laughs> yep. So we have seven minutes uh, remaining and at least two questions. Uh, so let's go to the questions. Does it work? I think you should start speaking. Maybe it will pick I'll start. Up. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, the panel just now and the panel earlier about workforce and human capital are acknowledging and discussing you know, the, the economic, necessary economic framing of what we're all here to talk about today. But I wanted to share a little bit of pushback that I've gotten in my own work from a community that I haven't seen represented here today, which is people living with brain-based disabilities who aren't necessarily seeking treatment or intervention, but are instead seeking social accommodation or social change. And that is because those folks are used to being framed as costs and used to being thought of as something that needs to be fixed or prevented. And, and in significant sectors of that community, it's not a monolith, but particularly in certain um, populations of non-neurotypical folks, and I'm not trying to speak for them, but they, this is the, what I have heard and wanted to share, is that they, uh, they don't appreciate the economic framing at all. I mean, Joe is, Joe's work on in drawing the focus on social production is really important. And Mary Lou uh, alluded to this earlier when she was talking about strengths as well as weaknesses. But going to Quasi's point about identity, rights, and fairness, I think we need to, we collectively in this room, need to be mindful and bring that community in as well because thriving can take a lot of different forms, especially for folks living with identities that again are not seeking kind of interventions or even prevention of their type of um, lived experience. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think um, that's a very good point. I mean, of course, the economic resilience uh, debate is essential because without that, uh, we won't move the needle, but at the same time, we have to be sensitive to the needs and expectations of, uh, of those concerned. Um, Alan. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, we're here partly to think about the SDGs, complex challenges, um, and I think it's been spoken about a bit. Social and ecological justice can't be separated. They're fundamentally interrelated. You know, climate, biodiversity, misogyny, racism, uh, you know, obscene inequality and in inequity, air quality, these are all connected. Um, I, you know, I've, ad I've advised an impact investing group. We talked about a kind of, I, I was trying to, trying to advocate for a kind of cluster investing. Um, 
it's, you know, but there are nonlinear dynamics involved here. And, all, you know, I was talking with someone earlier about the difference between correlation and causality. It's very difficult if investors want to see bang for the buck. They want to see, you know, we put some money in here and we can absolutely demonstrate that this is what we've delivered. We've made a difference. And, you know, Joanne, you were talking about metrics. So I suppose, you know, with the, the people from, you know, EIB and, you know, in fact, the whole panel, just thinking about how you invest in uh, challenges which will have nonlinear dynamics and won't necessarily deliver. You can measure impact. I've done it, but it's a challenge. So I'm curious what the thoughts are on that. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. I will go to Shiva in a second, but there's last question uh, from Franco. Uh, hi, uh, Franco Pestilli from the University of Texas, Austin. I'm here to represent the International Brain Initiative. One comment and question to, first of all, I love the panel. I love the diversity. I love the accents. I lived 10 years in New York, and I used to say that I, I also have a strong accent. I used to say that my favorite accent is always the one from the UK. Um, but I, I think... I think what is uh, maybe important to discuss is data, uh, because we're talking about mental health and, uh, and brain health, and, and that's about data. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from the panel uh, thoughts about how to manage data, how to get to share data across countries, because there's a global pattern of closing borders for data. And uh, we are working on data with the Wellcome Trust and the International Brain Initiative. So I'm very curious to hear what, from your perspective, what is it that we can do and needs to do about data? Super. Thank you so much. Uh, so with two minutes left, uh, I would like to go to, <laughs> to Shiva on Alan's question, nonlinear dynamics and investment. I mean, uh, not an easy one either. <laughs> Well, I, I, I hope that Alan and uh, I connect and we will have a longer conversation because this indeed, what I would say is, I think this is where, as I mentioned, we need to ensure that um, we have financial instruments, especially in the public sector, uh, and this is at the national level, at the EU level, at, at multilateral levels, that actually can take um, risks that are, so to speak, not bankable or investable. Because with that additional risk taking, we actually paved the way for others to come in. Uh, then there's this whole impact, you know, financing, which the EIB um, is also trying to um, uh, sort of roll out. But it is a very, I mean, this is when you have an impact based uh, sort of outcome-based financing, but these are inherently very complex transactions, but we have a whole team dedicated to structuring those. So what I would say is, Alan, uh, please get in touch. I'm on LinkedIn and, and yeah, we should definitely have that conversation. I think we need certainly um, more financial, uh, finance science interaction. I think I learned a lot just from listening to you all. Um, and I hope that we bring also a bit of a financial perspective and learn how to, to actually structure our instruments to be fit for purpose, because this is obviously a huge, yeah, a capital intensive um, area, even the, the prevention part of it already. Great, thank you so much, um, Shiva, and we would, we would love to have a follow-up discussion on, uh, on the brain capital approach uh, as well. Uh, before we finish, Joanne. No, I just wanted to probably answer a couple of questions in one go. Um, my lab back in, uh, at the University of Sydney, we uh, have come across this problem that policymakers have, oh, everything's interconnected. We show them that it's interconnected, but they just find that overwhelming. And so we've been engaging in complex systems modelling and simulation to tackle just that problem of non-linearity and, and bringing together, you know, data sources across the economic sector, social sector and health sector to be able to model, you know, what solutions in what sectors are going to deliver what level of impact over what time frame sort of thing so that we are able to, um, you know, make forward projections comparing against a baseline of business as, uh, um, as usual of what's going to have the, the biggest impacts and, of course, weaving into that the economics um, so that we can look at uh, a lot of the, you know, cost-benefit analysis and all that sort of thing. So very happy to talk to, to you after about that.
Great, thank you so much. And now Mitch. Yes, and just to get to Franco's question about the data, I think one important point about data is that um, we can collect a lot of data and collect it in a lot of new ways, but we run the risk of perpetuating some of those same biases, you know, in, in the collection of the new data as well and the way that we use it that we've seen before. So uh, the AHA just came out with a, a statement of six principles on uh, how we should use and manage data, including stewardship and access and, and equity meaning that uh, you know, we need to be sure that as we collect data, we're collecting it from an inclusive representative group and that that data can then be shared with that group as well. Uh, and, and I think that the issue about data, especially as we think about AI and how data is going to feed into these algorithms, which is obviously happening, um, we need a, a massive public education effort and patient education effort around data also because people don't understand how their data does get used. Uh, and I, I think just like we need scientific literacy in, in the population, we need it around data specifically. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so Alessio talked to us about a complete uh, reinvention needed in, uh, uh, in climate uh, policy terms. Earlier today and during this panel, we also talked about the reinvention. Is it complete? Maybe it's complete that is needed in, uh, in healthcare. Um, all I, I would say is that uh, sometimes uh, we think that the case is obvious, uh, but what we should remember uh, is that may be obvious to us, but it's by no means uh, obvious to policymakers out there and the, the broader public. Huh? So there is a, a discussion to be had about how do we connect sort of our level um, of conviction with the level of conviction um, in the policymaking circles uh, and among the public at large. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists in Luxembourg, Brussels, and here. And we. Uh